Well, hello, and <laughs> what? Nothing. Welcome back to Tragedy with a View. I have no intro for this episode because it's going to be looking different, and I'm very excited about it. Wahoo! And I'm sure you will notice by the title that this is a re-release of the second episode that we did. All the way back, uh, almost a year ago. Over more a year than a ago. year ago. Yeah, um, and so I will explain here in just a second why we're doing it. But first, I want to s- say, if you've already listened to it, thank you so much for listening again. If you have not listened to it, I am sorry for the audio. It's not as good as what I would have liked it to be but it was all a learning experience to get us to where we are today and so now into why this episode is looking different Kayla why is this episode looking different because the episode that we did on the Schroeder's Pants Cave was about a man who sadly lost his life after getting stuck in a passage within the cave and his name was James Mitchell and James's brother Bill reached out to me and I am going to read his email to you guys that he sent to me because I think it provides some extra information and uh, just reiterates some of the things that I said in the story. And I um, also got some photos from him because he took part in the recovery effort. Re- yeah, recovery of his brother's remains. So I will read that now. And then I'm going to let the rerun of this episode yeah the episode two you're gonna hear it again um enjoy i was browsing youtube today and found your podcast on the schroeder's pants cave recovery of james mitchell i'm jim's brother i thought you did a very nice job his actual height and weight in 1965 was about five eight and 180 pounds but the rest of the Five, story eight, 180 pounds mm-hmm. holy moly he's like fraser i think is short and stocky stocky yeah i think i don't remember what exactly i had in that episode I but either. i think i think i was incorrect i feel like on i would have commented if, it, if i would have heard that yeah that is so, a very stocky build yeah So he also left out, or he also says that you left out Heidi Miller, who was the gal that remained behind in the cold waiting for the rescue team while Charles Bennett went out looking for help. Remember, in those days, we used calcium carbide lamps, so Heidi would have been in the dark most of the night, which I think is a very interesting uh, comment to make because unless you participated in these activities at that time, you wouldn't know. For the recovery, Kevin and I rappelled into the bottom and found the Prusik knots next to his helmet. Christian and the rest of the team remained above in the telephone room where we brought back the remains. The best description was at the beginning of your podcast where you talked about squeezing through the gun barrel into what is called the telephone room. I actually had to remove my helmet and push it ahead of me. Then let out some air and slide forward and crawl into the telephone room. That. Like a worm above the floor and not fall into it. Repelling off of the tripod that we had erected wasn't hard, but he says jugging or Jumar ascenders 
back up under the cold water was challenging. My brother had to slide his freezing knots up and he was wearing full coveralls soaking wet so he would have been close to 200 pounds with his cave bag. It turned out to be impossible. You can see the type of minor lights on Jim's helmet that we used in those days. The rope is a 7 16th Plymouth Gold Line modern st static cave line. Sorry, there was a bug on me. Modern static cave line came later. Our Prusik knots back then were made from 3 8 inch nylon. Modern ascenders like Jumars and Petzels are superior and would not seize up in the cold water. By the way, the experience of retrieving my brother's remains after 41 years was very much a closure for me and a profound experience. I enjoyed your story, which left a positive understanding of what explorers are like. And so after a couple of email exchanges with him, which I did get his permission to share this information, he also says that being in the cave put me in direct touch with my brother. We were two years apart in age. We have done many cave trips together, so it was just like old times. Your, your podcast reminded me of the very nostalgic trip. I brought back some of Jim's ashes to my father and described the specific challenges that Jim had faced. I then met with Charles Bennett, a quantum computer designer, and talked with Hedy Miller, who lived in Europe, and once again closed that chapter in our lives. And he also mentions that he loved the description on the Prusik knots. I've never climbed down on them, only up. Also, in the early 60s, we repelled with brake bars on the steel carabiners. Figure eights and other repelling devices came later. Brake bars? Is that something like a brakes on your bike or what? Um, I believe it's basically a device that has brakes built into it so that way the rope Just won't like slip a, through. Is it like a mechanical? Like you have to be strong to like lock it then? It's like it's I don't think so. I think it I think it just uses traction. It's friction. it's like I th I believe it's something that is similar to um when you go rock climbing and somebody's holding the rope from the bottom. Oh. The I forget what it's called. Clearly, we are not climbers. Yeah, no. So that's the gist of the email. I will be posting the photos that he sent to me. And enjoy a rerun of episode number two. Yay. I want you to take a moment and imagine with me. Close your eyes. Take a full breath. You are laying on your belly, head tilted to the side arms outstretched overhead and enfolding you in a cold, hard bear hug is solid rock. You have just enough space to flex your feet, connect your toes to the rock, and scoot yourself forward with the help of your clawing fingertips. Then, as the space becomes tighter, you exhale the air from your lungs to give yourself a millimeter of space to move. The cave closes in, and yet you push forward because you know you are going someplace that 99% of the population wouldn't dare. This tight passage is the journey, and you never know when or how that journey will end. Welcome to Tragedy with a View. Are you claustrophobic? Me? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, I would do what's necessary, but I wouldn't put myself in that situation on purpose? Okay. I wouldn't call myself claustrophobic. Okay. You are. I am. Yes. I am. Okay. Maybe you should tell your personal story. Which one? About the rug. You don't have to tell. You can just say that I'm claustrophobic because I got rolled up in a rug. <laughs> I don't need to tell the story you just did. <laughs> well. It's okay. That's why. Now you know. Yeah. But I mean, I think I think pe being rolled up in a rug is pretty common. It's a pretty common thing that kids do, I think. I didn't get rolled up in a rug when I was a kid. <laughs> I'm going to I'm going to have to ask Chad. Please now. put it in the comments if you've been rolled up in a rug. If you have You know what? That's going to be a good like Instagram question, like story question. I'll do that. I'll do that after this episode sometime. I'll post that question. 
The OGs will know. A millimeter is very small, by the way. It is. Space you can get. Okay. Um, in 1947, in the Adirondack foothills, 10 miles east of Ithaca and 200 miles northwest of New York City, in the town of Dolgeville, New York, a cave was discovered. Herb Schroeder, a local school principal, was out driving one day to map the bus routes when he noticed a significant amount of water flowing through a field and then disappearing. His curiosity got the best of him, so he followed the water until he came upon the entrance of a cave. Herb and his friend, George Lyon, explored the cave, and it was in this moment that the cave got its name, Schroeder's Pants Cave. Herb, while squeezing through a tight section, felt his pants catch on a rock, and then they gave way, ripping a hole into his pants. I believe that the land which this cave was found on was either owned by the family of George Lyon, or he later obtained title to this land uh, because he and his family would go on to explore this cave for generations. In 1965, James Mitchell, also known as Jim, stood five foot 11 and weighed 185 pounds and he loved caving. He was an amateur caver, also known as a splunker or potholer. He was a chemist and he was awarded the annual award in the National Speleological Society for his research and papers. Say that 10 times fast. Absolutely not. At 23, he had already explored 18 caves and when he ran into Heidi Miller, 22, and Charles Bennett, 23, and found that they had a mutual interest in caving, they decided to get together a week later to explore Schroeder's Pants Cave. Getting permission from George Lyon, George asked them to stop by before they went in, but when the group stopped to talk to him, he wasn't home. The date was February 13, 1965, and the weather in New York in February is cold and snowy as expected. However, this week in particular had been warmer than normal with temperatures hovering right around freezing or slightly above. This meant that the snow was melting and larger than normal amounts of runoff were seen. Parking on the road, Jim, Heady, and Charles wearing jeans and overalls trekked the one and a half miles through snow up to their knees to reach the entrance of the cave. Arriving at the entrance, they squeezed their way through routes known as Lemon Squeeze, which is extremely tight and has some drop-offs in it, Z-Bend, where you have to zigzag your way through very short spaces and some of the passages are only 18 inches in diameter, a Z bend? You're zigzagging. Is it flat still? So you're just like. Well, I think. I don't think you're like on your belly. I think. You know what? That's a good question because I don't know. But I, I from my understanding of it, they were upright. You're you're following what the cave is is giving you. So you're zigzagging back and forth through this channel. Okay. But yes, you're you're scurrying back and forth in a very, very slow scurry. <laughs> scurry. They then came to Gun Barrel, which is an awkward channel with an opening at the bottom and the top. Starting on the bottom, you have to push your way through ranges of flexibility, even I don't have, to get through the hole and then shift your way up through to the top. You mean flexibility that I don't have? I don't have it either. You could do it. I would not put myself in a position where I need to do it. Me either. (laughs) Then the cave finally opens into an open cavern large enough to fit a house in. Centered on the floor is an opening to a vertical shaft. The entrance of this shaft sat approximately 250 feet below the surface of the earth. 
and after traversing another 80 feet down the shaft, the cave opened into another bell-shaped cavern. These open spaces were cold and wet and are said to feel like a meat locker. And as someone who has previously worked in a meat locker, that does not sound enjoyable. Not with what they said they were wearing. And going through knee-deep snow. It all plays part. First to enter the shaft, Jim worked his way down and with the entrance of the shaft being so narrow, he had to contort himself a bit before he was engulfed by this section of the cave. James was using a knot called the Prusik knot, which is a friction knot to help climb or ascend a rope. So it is specifically made to help you go up and these types of knots have two knots, one stacked on top of the other, and when pressure is applied to them, they tighten and the friction does not allow them to lower down the rope. The bottom knot has a loop that extends down to the climber's foot and the top is attached to the harness. So when you stand into the foot rope, the top knot doesn't have any pressure on it, so it becomes free to move. You slide that knot as high as you can, Letting the pressure out of the foot strap and sitting into the harness, you then slide that bottom knot up to meet the first with your foot rising with it, and then the process repeats until you reach the top. For safety, a lot of people will tie quick release knots as you climb, and these will help catch you in the event that the Prusik knots come undone or fail for whatever reason. And you tried this before, but I've, climbing a tree, so have, was it very easy to use? Yes. It's very methodical, so like you you stand, slide, sit, slide, stand, slide, sit, slide, and it's, it's a little awkward because, at least climbing a tree, because it's not like you're next to the base of the tree, so you don't have anything for stability, so you're just kind of like... As you're, you're sitting and standing, you, you move around a little bit, but it's not This not seems difficult. like it would be, well, that's interesting that you say that. It seems, when I think about it, it seems like it would be more difficult to do in an enclosed space. But maybe having the extra walls nearby would be helpful. Well, I think, I think it would be useful depending on the width of the cave. Because if it's too tight, you're not really able to like sit, sit or stand real easily. Yeah, I think I think that's a good point. It'd be that... interesting to see. I mean, with all these tools, there's probably like I'm gonna pull out my trusty Prusik knot in this situation, but in another situation, they would do something else. Mm -hmm. So. And I don't know what the reason was for using the Prusik knots in this particular circumstance because they were descending. And like I said, the Prusik knots are made to help you climb. You can descend with the Prusik knots rather easily by applying pressure to the top knot and that releases the friction just enough to slide down the rope in a semi-controlled manner. And when I say that, I don't mean like you're... you're falling in any sort of sense but you there's a little bit of friction that still is applied there and it can get a little bit jerky if you know the pressure isn't appropriately distributed i am an expert at jerky descents with a prusik knot <laughs> <laughs> i'm sure that it requires some practice and skill mm-hmm it was here that the climbers noticed the large amount of runoff that was flowing through the caves. Approximately 10 gallons of water every minute were flowing down the shaft like a waterfall. And the temperatures ranged from 31 to 35 degrees Fahrenheit or negative one to two degrees Celsius. As Jim made his way into the entrance of the shaft, he came to a more horizontal channel, roughly the length of a dinner table, that then released back down into a straight vertical drop. Jim made his way through the horizontal channel and then down into the vertical shaft 
and after about 20 feet he found another hole where he spent some time exploring this section of the cave and this part of the cave had been explored previously and it was known to not have gone anywhere. Um, it, you were led to a dead end and he wanted to check it out for himself. So then coming out to the main shaft, he got tangled in the ropes and became stuck. With one arm trapped, he was unable to lower himself. So he started to work his way back up the shaft to his newfound friends talking to them along the way. Jim was the most experienced out of these three climbers. Senior climber. Yes. So he was the one who... I mean, he was the guy that got an award for the Speleological Society. Speleological. Um, yeah, so he, he was the one who was kind of talking to them and helping keep them calm. And... As I mentioned earlier, the opening of the shaft was extremely narrow and Jim got stuck about 10 feet from the opening of that shaft. Because of the shape of the shaft and the narrowness at the entrance, Hedy and Charles were unable to do much to assist Jim. Every time they pulled on the rope, it would release back down into the shaft when they let it go, as they had nothing to anchor it to, and with the shape of the shaft, they just weren't able to get any leverage to pull him any closer to the opening. Because of the snow melt runoff, his rope and knots started to become frozen, and Jim eventually was unable to move the knots at all. At this point, he removed the glove to the hand that was free and tried to use his bare hand to get a better grip on the knots which left his body exposed to the cold water running over him after 45 minutes jim stopped responding so charles decided he needed to go get help and he worked his way back out of the cave which took approximately an hour and then ran to a nearby farmhouse who then called for a rescue. State and local rescue squads appeared, including volunteer firefighter George Lyon. George felt particularly terrible about this, considering the fact that if he had been home, he could have warned the group about the conditions of the cave. This is what usually happens in terrible situations. Mm-hmm. One, one little thing goes wrong and it just cascades. Like a waterfall through a vertical shaft. Yikes. 250 feet underground. When state and local rescuers were unsuccessful after two days, they called a National Grotto Rescue Squad, who flew in from Washington, D.C. This was one of the first of its kind of rescue groups, and this group in particular didn't have a lot of experience with caving, so that added an extra layer of challenge to the rescue process. The team was made up of fairly young men, mostly in the ages of 19 to 24, and this rescue was most of theirs first real test. So what was their, what were they originally gathered together for? So like if this wasn't their primary task? From my understanding, it was a, it was to be a like national expert search and rescue. Oh. But so it could have just been over land, like if somebody got stuck in the wild, they would go right. But I mean, as you can imagine, there's not a ton of cavers walking around the streets, and so I think at this point they just didn't have the understanding or the knowledge of what it would take to perform a rescue in a cave. I don't think anyone really did at this point in time. Upon entering the cave and approaching Gun Barrel, one of the rescuers freaked out, threw up, and then backed his way out, which same I would do. 
same skeet. I wouldn't even go into this I random cave. I wouldn't. No. There's a hole in the ground? Nope. Good for them. I'm not going in there. There's only one hole that I'll be entering in the ground, and hopefully it's far in the future. You don't want to be cremated? Mm, not really. Okay. Good to know. I want to be buried with a tree. That's fine. Just so you know. That's a hole. Yeah. Only one hole. That's only one hole. And it's not Hopefully. very deep. Maybe six feet. Six feet, yeah. Okay. We are super far. <laughs> <laughs> I, I am pulling you over to the dark side. Okay. Um, <laughs> this grotto team strung wires through the cave to set up a telephone room. So that way they would be able to communicate with those who were on the surface. Upon entering or upon arrival at the vertical shaft, Grotto member William Karras worked his way down to Jim and found that he had passed away from exposure to the cold water, which means hypothermia, which is actually the most common cause of cave death, cave injury and death. A lunker disaster is hypothermia. Mm-hmm. The ground is cold when you're... 200 feet, 50 feet under. So this no longer was a rescue, but now a recovery mission. And seeing as you cannot contort dead bodies in the way that you need in order to get out of the cave system, it was decided that a hole would need to be drilled so that way they could bring his body up to the surface that way. In... The cave and on the surface, a map began to be drawn to determine exactly where underground this cavern was. The crew on the surface then began to clear away trees and brush and dig a hole to be drilled into. Meanwhile, the rescuers in the cavern began to work on widening the shaft so that way they could easily access Jim's body. Approximately two days later, the drill from the surface reached the level of the cavern. However, they were only a foot off of their mark. Because nothing broke through into the cavern, but rock and debris began to fall from the ceiling, it was believed that the drilling was causing the cave to collapse. At this point, due to safety concerns, the recovery attempt was called off and all rescuers were ordered to abandon the cave. Once everyone was clear of the cave, the crew used dynamite to destroy and seal the entrance of the cave, and a headstone was later placed to honor Jim. It's actually an interesting thought, is I wonder how often how often cavers die, and then how often they close off the cave when someone dies. Like, is that just like normal space? spelunking procedure tradition to block off a cave if somebody passes away well i don't think it's it's the the cavers or the spelunkers who are like yeah we need to not go back in there i think it's um, it's the man yeah it's some sort of governmental official saying that this is posing too much of a risk to the people who enter it we need to close it off um And I do have another story that I'll tell eventually of another similar thing where a guy died in the cave and they sealed it because it was too dangerous. Um, It's a completely different story, though. But it is something that happens, I think, relatively often is that they determine it's just unsafe and probably can't fathom why people would want to enter a cave in the beginning. And it costs a lot of money. And it costs a lot of money. Speaking of... These initial efforts took six days and cost approximately $500,000. But that doesn't mean that uh, Jim's life wasn't worth that much, but it does. Rescue attempts cost a lot of money. That is correct. And that's the end of that story. Wow. Or is it? No. (laughs) It is not. There is a whole nother adventure that took place after the fact. 41 years later, Jim would be brought back into daylight. Two years after the original entrance to Schroeder's Pants Cave was demolished, a new entrance to the cave was found, and people began to enter the cave from this new way. 
approximately 20 people had worked their way to Jim's resting place over the 41 years he spent there and everyone stayed respectful since it was viewed as his grave site. In 2003, Christian Lyon, actor and grandson of George Lyon, who explored the cave in 1947 with Herb Schroeder, started to explore the idea of retrieving Jim's remains. You may be familiar with Christian Lyon for his roles in 911, Shameless, and How to Get Away with Murder. And I grabbed this directly from the IMBD site because I think it's cool when actors have fun previous lives. Well, it just shows that they're humans too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Before arriving in Hollywood, Christian was a New York State firefighter and EMT for eight years, which has led to numerous acting jobs playing firefighters, EMTs, and paramedics. He was a drummer in the band The cosmic rescue team featuring john york of the rock and roll hall of fame inducted group the birds for three years christian organized and planned a recovery attempt and i think it's important to keep in mind that since 1965 technology and rescue and recovery techniques have drastically improved allowing them to accomplish a task that was previously seen as unsafe in 2006, with the permission of Jim's family, Christian entered the cave with six cave rescuers and filmed the entire process in order to use footage for a documentary, which is yet to be released. With them was Jim's brother, Bill, and Jim's father also wanted to attend. However, at 89 years old, he was unable to make the trip. Good for him. Leading the, the ex- thought that counts leading the expedition was Kevin Dumont from Kentucky and I get the sense that he's a pretty expert caver and Spelunker. potentially rescuer um, but I had a hard time finding information about him so I bet she was part of the National Grotto Rescue Team I don't know I don't Use your imagination. I had a hard time finding information. Kevin, if you listen to this episode, please reach reach out. out. (laughs) Reach out. I'd love to hear from you. Um, It took them four hours to reach Jim's remains, which were found scattered below the vertical shaft he died in. Jim's brother, Bill, stood below the shaft and looked up. Introspectively, he said, there's no way my brother would have made it out not with 35 degree water pouring on him. With his remains, they found his helmet that had 18 marks chiseled into it to signify each of the caves he had previously explored, with Schroeder's pants being his 19th. Jim's remains were returned to his family. The events that took place in 1965 sparked a worldwide revolution for new safety measures and rescue teams that we continue to see today. Along with that, the James Gentry Mitchell Memorial Award was established in 1969, and it is awarded to the best scientific paper presented by members of the National Speleological Society ages 25 or younger. To be eligible, you must apply or be nominated. And before we end this episode, I want to give some attention to how you traverse caves. And if anyone listening has experienced caving, feel free to reach out. Or tell us resources. Or give us information. Yeah, or give us resources. Uh, We're on all the social media and you can email me. I'd love to hear what is normal practice because finding information on how you find your way through a cave was really difficult and all that I really found was that you need to take a map and don't be stupid. But the map doesn't really make a lot of sense to me because if you're moving through a really tight area, how are you supposed to just like stop and and check out the map when 
the reality is you're contorting yourself to get through the cave in the first place. Yeah, I mean, when I think about a cave, I think about like a labyrinth. So maybe you're supposed to be like, always go right. And then eventually you'll come back out again. That's unrealistic. But my thought was like, maybe you always have a rope that's like attached to the outside. So those people had like a telephone wire that they moved all the way down there. So my whole thought is like, how are you supposed to know how to get back? If there's more than one path, like if there's one path then it's easy to get back. But if there's more than one path, then it's gonna be like two rights, one left, down up, square, circle, that's like a reference to video games, but it's like, you're gonna forget. Especially like if you get injured because then you'll be stressed. Mm -hmm. So it's like, how are you supposed to remember that you're supposed to take a, a left and then an immediate right and then go straight at the fork? And then there's also, so I didn't think about it until now, that the, the rope idea isn't exactly plausible because- It's a lot of rope. That's a lot of rope. How are you gonna carry all that rope? You're not. And the chances, and you, you also don't have a like one single rope that is that long. So you're gonna be putting knots in the rope that are likely to get caught somewhere. And- Actually, interesting idea. Probably is not good for the environment, but like a spray can. What if you had like a neon spray can that you'd like, if there was multiple directions, you'd be like spray. And then yours would be green for this trip. So well, then you would always follow the green. Yeah, I mean, they do that on trails. Yeah, I know. So that would make sense. Maybe that's what they do for caves. Maybe. If anybody knows, let us let us know. Tell me. Yeah, we're just going to keep theorizing over here. And be probably be wrong. But So if I was doing it, I would drop Skittles along the way and then eat them on the way back. Because I like sugar. And if it were me... It would be cookies. It would be cookies, but I'd be eating them along the way and then... <laughs> not have any cookies. Not have any crumbs to eat on the way out. Okay. Um, and then before we really wrap this up, I wanted to give a special shout out to the podcast, The Lost Boys of Hannibal. I listened to one of their episodes from back in 2019, I think, where they interviewed Christian Lyon. And it really gave a lot of clarity to what it is like to go into this cave system. And he gave more details about the lemon squeeze and gum barrel and, and those passages that I pulled some of my information from. I don't think their podcast is specifically about this story. It seemed like it was in relation to something else that they were covering. But I am going to put the link in the show notes if you want to go give that a listen. And that's it. Thanks for listening. Another thing that I would do is I would... When you're walking in the wild, be sure to watch your step. Thank you for listening, and don't forget to subscribe and review to be the first to hear our bi-weekly episodes. Please find and like us at Tragedy with a View on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. If you have a story of your own that involves the great outdoors, we would love to hear it. Please email tragedywithaview at gmail.com for a chance to have your story featured on a later episode. Thank you again for listening. We'll see you next time.